Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the Kentucky, and so glad that you've decided to join us for this episode. I've got what I trust will be a, a fun episode for you. It's a topic that is very dear to my heart. <laughs> it is, if you know me personally, and very well personally, you probably know that I really love tanks. I have, for as long as I can remember, I used to love watching the war movies with the tanks in them. I, any Anything I could see, if we watched documentaries and there were tanks, you know, just, I, I, I don't know, they caught my attention. They fascinated me. I had toys that were, were, were accurate scale models of, of tanks. It was just, I loved them. And that, of course, hasn't really changed very much, as you might guess from uh, the topic and how I'm starting this episode. I've studied them more and, and sort of uh, changed the way that I, I look at them, for one, as I've learned more about them and all that. But also, uh, you know, I know more about them. I know more of the technical details. It's something that, that, it, that it's, a, it's a very, very strong interest of mine. And I'm hoping that we're going we're to kind of relax a little bit with this episode, do a little bit more of a fun episode, and talk about the major American tanks of World War II. Now, we can't do a, a comprehensive video in 20 some odd minutes, of course, and that's not the goal here. It's to give you a brief survey of the major American tanks of World War II, put a picture with them, kind of see them, and maybe be able to identify them a little bit. Maybe one or two will stick in your head anyway. This is a topic that, while meant to be fun, there is a certain value to it. We're talking about World, world War II, the, the largest conflict in world recorded history anyway. It is one of the most devastating conflicts. There were so many changes that happened, changes in technology and development of, of, of battle doctrines and uh, political changes. You think about the Soviet Union and the way that was handled during and after the war and the Cold War that would come after. So much happened then that affected the way we think about things and the way we live today. And as Americans, of course, it's important to understand our part in that to at least a small degree. And it's a topic that is not well known in general. And also, you could argue that anybody, because it was such a, a large-scale war that had such a massive effect on so many people, it really, it's, it's kind of the heritage of everyone to understand at least a little bit about this war. So hopefully you find it cool, hopefully you find it interesting and fun, but also there, there is value in, in at least having a basic understanding of some of these things as well. The tank, which was first introduced in World War I, as, as many of you may know, at least that basic fact, it is a weapon that in many ways has revolutionized modern warfare. There are a whole lot of incorrect stereotypes and beliefs about tanks that are usually perpetuated by Hollywood and video games, and that's fine for what it is, but tanks are not this, this unstoppable behemoth that that, you know, it's basically invincible and it just charges through enemy fire and, and runs over everything and you can't stop it. They are extremely powerful vehicles when used correctly, um, but they are still very vulnerable to many different weapons, even infantry weapons. Weapon infantry actually have a much greater effect on tanks than you might think, so much so that a tank unsupported by infantry is almost guaranteed to be destroyed uh, if the, the fighters they're going against are, are any ways competent at all. In fact, that's something that uh, there's a lot of there, especially early on, there was a lot of talk about the Soviets. Well, I say the Soviet, the Russians in the war with Russia and Ukraine kind of demonstrating that the tank was dead, that there wasn't really a use for the tank anymore because so many Russian tanks were being knocked out. However, if you watched footage, most of the time it was really poor use of tank doctrine. They were sending tanks into cities unsupported, and then you could have Ukrainian soldiers drop Molotov cocktails on top of them and burn the engine out or whatever the case might be. And it was really more of an illustration of a lot of the incorrect stereotypes about tanks and not that tanks were useless in and of themselves. That's basically always been the case about them. And uh, it's it's helpful to at least understand some, some basic... Um, application of, of the way tanks should be used. And people have said for a long time that tanks were going to be useless, that the development of weapons would make them obsolete, and they still haven't been uh, for all these years, and I doubt that they will be anytime soon as well. Anyway, tanks have had a huge effect. They're really cool. There's just a massive cool factor, I think, anyway. <laughs> I'm not the only one that thinks that, but I do think that they're really cool. Also, quick clarification of definitions. I may use the term AFV, which is short for Armored Fighting Vehicle, and that includes tanks. It also includes armored cars and armored personnel carriers and some other vehicles. Don't want to go too deep into that, um, but just think of it as a general term that includes tanks. Just like you might say a, a car or vehicle, and that includes trucks and vans and buses and cars, you know, sedans and coupes and everything else. Think of, maybe think of it that way. That may help you. So AFV 
accurate but more general than tank. And there were a lot of technological developments, just like today, technology developing and weapons, in the particular case of war, weapons and technology trying to adjust to that. It was the same thing back then. Difference in battle doctrines, the way people thought about using tanks was different than it was by the end of World War II, and that's different than it is today. Um, but a lot of the more modern doctrines did develop, and while they adjust and change some for modern technology, a lot of the basics stay the same. You'll see that with military strategy and those sorts of things. But as weird as the technology was at the time, as, as much as technology was developing and countries were trying to figure out how to use their tanks, America was no different in all of that. So that brings us to the three main sections, the first section being the early war. We'll talk about the early war, mid-war, and late war American tanks. And again, I mentioned this a moment ago, I believe, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's, it's some of the mo more significant, more common tanks that were used during the war. So the first, the first part, the early war, is kind of a, perhaps the most unique in some ways. As I mentioned, there was so much technology changing and everything, and battlefield requirements, battle doctrine, all that was changing, and it outpaced most countries' tank uh, arsenals and the, the doctrines that they used to, to use their tanks. And America was no different, but America had a couple of special factors in all this. One, they had a very under-equipped small military in the early war period, especially before and right as the we entered World War II, because America was neutral for the first few years of World War II. So we didn't have a strong military, and we actually, there were there were some cases, I could even talk about one in particular, that but I won't right now, not really the purpose of this episode, where we were not upgrading equipment like it needed to be, even if we had it available. And then also, we were often doing projects for the Allies, especially the British, in developing and producing new equipment, new weapons, new vehicles, new tanks. So kind of, you know, even though we were neutral, we have favored the Allies very heavily and were developing and building a lot of weapons for them. The British <clears throat> and the French were struggling a lot and they needed weapons, they needed vehicles, they needed tanks, and we were helping to fill that need very, very much. So, the first early war tank I want to talk about is the M3 Stuart. Now, if you know anything about World War II tanks, this may look kind of familiar. It's actually a earlier variant of a tank that we'll talk about in a little bit. But the M3 Stuart was a light tank, and it was actually fairly effective, and one of the few fairly effective vehicles in the U.S. arsenal at the beginning or, or early war period. It was used quite heavily by the British. They called it the honey light tank most of the time. They, The British, even when they used American vehicles, it was not uncommon for them to change the name a little bit. So they called it the honey, but the Stuart light tank was used by the British a lot in North Africa, in, in Africa in general, but particularly North Africa, where, where a lot of fighting took place with the Germans. And it, it functioned pretty well against, against early access, access vehicles, excuse me. A special note, even though America didn't use it a whole lot, didn't actually see a whole lot of combat with American um, forces, it did see a significant amount of combat in the early uh, Pacific Island battles right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese invaded a lot of American-held territories, one especially being the Philippines. And with 37 millimeter anti-tank gun, while very quickly outclassed in the war, and this tank did become obsolete fairly quickly, at the same time it performed very well against the Japanese in the Philippines and maybe a handful of other American-held territories. The, the Japanese did not have very heavily armored or very sophisticated tanks. They did their job when they were fighting the Chinese, and, and they could get through jungles and, and not very well-developed areas pretty well. But they, didn't ha they weren't very well armored, and they didn't have very big guns, and the Stuart actually could handle them quite easily. And it was hard for the Japanese infantry to bring very effective anti-tank weapons. They either didn't have them, or they couldn't get them through the jungles and so on, especially when you're on the offensive. So it, it did serve very well in, in kind of a kind of a mini conflict you don't hear much about in the Philippines in those first few months of the war. Now those troops were for the most part captured or killed, and you get into some mistreatment of American severe mistreatment of American prisoners by the Japanese. But that's not the purpose of this episode. But it did serve well there. But you know, it uh, it was kind of obsolete pretty quick. But it served well against certain opponents and early in the war. The next tank is the M3 Lee. Now, this is a medium tank, and it's a it's a bit of an odd-looking tank. You would probably agree with me. It often it gets a lot of criticism as well from tank enthusiasts. It's not all merited, though. 
And let me be clear, the M3 Lee certainly had its disadvantages, but it should be understood what the M3 Lee was for. <clears throat> the U.S. was developing the M4 Sherman, which we'll talk about in a moment, and the Sherman was a medium tank that was actually decently sophisticated, all things considered, but the British really, really needed tanks. Bad. They really, really needed tanks. And they basically asked or pushed the U.S. to, to produce something that they could get some heavier firepower because the tanks they were getting, like I mentioned with the M3 Stuart, had, they didn't have very big guns. And they served well for what they were, but the, Ger the the British needed something with a little bit more punch. They needed more firepower as they were starting to face more powerful German units, especially. So the M3 Lee was basically a stopgap. It's built on the chassis of the, of the M4 Sherman, but it was a stopgap that you, we could produce easily, get more firepower to the British, and fill that niche until the M4 Sherman was ready for full production and, and we could get shipped to the British to help them out. It was a stopgap tank, but it fulfilled its role pretty well, actually. It, it had a 37 millimeter like the M3 Stuart on the turret, which you can see in the picture there at the very top, but it has a 75 millimeter gun, howitzer, on the side. It's a hull mounted gun. It's not on the turret and it has a limited field of motion, but it, it gave the, the M3 Lee a lot more fire, firepower for the time, especially. It had its disadvantages. It was a very high profile tank, which is not good in a lot of cases, generally for out of bond, especially when you're fighting in the desert. Uh, sticking out like a sore thumb isn't necessarily a good thing. And you don't want to get seen by the enemy because then if they don't see you, they can't shoot you. But anyway, it served well for what it was. The British liked it well enough. It had a lot of firepower and until they could get better things, it served its purpose. And the Americans did use it a little bit, although it was fairly limited because we got the Sherman up and rolling pretty quick. There's an old war movie, if you if you watch war movies at all, called Sahara. And there's also an action movie with Matthew McConaughey from the early 2000s that has the same title. This is a much older movie, and the, the, the key characters, the protagonists, are the crew of an M3 Lee, uh, American crew of an M3 Lee, in North Africa during the war. It's, it's a fun movie. They did a remake of it as well. I think John Belushi was the, was the main star in that but it was the same story basically but retold a little bit and and they had better effects and and uh, better views and all sorts of stuff and it, it was just, both are pretty good movies the the old one has humphrey bogart in it as the main character if you're familiar with old actors it might be a good watch for you sometime i like it it's it's a cool movie overall but that has the m3 lee as kind of the centerpiece tank so that's cool very fun movie but that's the M3 Lee. It was a stopgap tank. It was fairly effective for what it was until better, better equipment could be acquired. That brings us to mid-war tanks. So the mid-war is when things really started to heat up for the U.S. They were really getting much more involved in the war in North Africa and the Pacific especially. Um, and they were starting to, you know, starting to get ready for the invasion of Normandy around this point. And technology was starting to ratchet up too. The Germans were starting to field... Uh, bigger and better tanks. The famous Tiger tank was fielded in 1943. <clears throat> Definitely a, a huge change because you now had a, a very heavily armored tank with a very powerful gun that could dominate virtually any tank that it came across without exception in the, in the 1943 range. And now we're really starting to, hey, we've got to get some different technology out of here. We've got to get more powerful tanks. The first tank that I want to talk about in this period would be the M4 Sherman. Now, I've mentioned it a little bit already. The M4 Sherman is probably one of the best known tanks from World War II. It is one of the uh, most produced tanks in history, and it had an extremely varied career. It had many, many different design iterations and models and modifications and upgrades done to it. It also tends to get a bad reputation. Um, it, it was just, it was really a bad tank, but we produced so many of them, it was okay. In a lot of ways, that's not true. It's often also made or, or compared with the Tiger tank, which they're not even the same class of vehicle. If you've ever seen the movie Fury or know about the movie Fury, one of the big battles is, the, is a Sherman against the Tiger tank. It's not really a fair assessment in a lot of ways, but the Sherman actually served with distinction. It was pretty effective for what it was. It did its job well. It was a multi-role tank in a lot of ways. It wasn't meant just to take on other tanks. It was meant as infantry support. It was meant to take on other tanks. It was a very much a multi-role tank that did its job well. It was reliable. 
Uh, it was fairly easy to maintain and repair. You could build a lot of them, and it had it was effective. It maybe wasn't the best when it came to armor. It maybe didn't have the most powerful gun, but it was very effective for what it was meant to do. You could produce a lot of them. You could field them in numbers, and you could keep them in the field. That was one issue a lot of German armor had, especially later in the war. They're making these massive heavy tanks with uh, huge amounts of armor and, and big guns and everything, but they could barely keep them in the field. If they didn't run out of gas, they broke down, and you'd be lucky to get the parts you needed. And if they broke down in the field, there's a very good chance you just had to abandon them because you couldn't repair them yourself and hope that your lines didn't get pushed back far enough by the advancing ally forces that you maybe could get a recovery vehicle out there to, to get it back to base and repair it. There were a huge number of German vehicles lost because they just broke down and you couldn't get them back to somewhere to get them repaired before they were captured or, or, or whatever. <clears throat> And with the Sherman, you got them on target. You got them where you needed where you needed them to be, and they did their job. Maybe they weren't the best of all things, but they did their job, and they did it well. The 75 millimeter howitzer that it had mounted, which is the same as the big gun on the M3 Lee, uh, the same gun there basically, and it was very effective. It, it was it was very effective against early to mid war German armor. And it was very effective against infantry and, and a very common threat for tanks wasn't necessarily other tanks, but was anti-tank guns that you might haul like an artillery piece. They'd be on wheels or, or you'd have kind of a trailer that you'd carry them in and they'd set them up in a defensive position. Those were extremely dangerous to tanks and very common. And the Sherman could deal with them pretty, pretty easily with their 75 millimeter howitzer. You just load some high explosive and hit close to that gun. And now you've taken out all the crew <laughs> for the gun with the fragmentation and everything. So it, it, it served well. Again, you could keep them on the battlefield. You could produce them in numbers and you could repair them. And honestly, they were a very good tank. And one of the good things about the Sherman, because they were produced so much, and it was a fairly simple design and everything, they were also constantly upgraded so that they could deal with some of the new challenges of the battlefields a lot easier. You know, upgraded guns, maybe better armor, different uh, hole producing types. You could cast holes or weld them. I'm trying not to get too often in the details here. But it was a very good gun, a very good tank that served very well. Another tank, we won't spend much time on this one, it's the M5 Stuart. Now, that's the same as the M3 Stuart when it comes to name, and it was basically the upgraded version of the M5. A little bit different hull shape, a little bit better armor, and, and some things like that. It was an upgrade, but it was still a Stuart. It, it uh, served, at this point in the war, it would be serving much more as a reconnaissance or maybe like raiding tank. It was very fast. And so you could use it to scout out targets. You could use it for some light combat, but you wouldn't want to bring it up against most tanks that it could potentially face at this point. But it served well for, for what it was. And uh, also, again, a very common, if you see tanks at fairs or, or other events, there's a very good chance it's an M5 Stuart. They were, they're fairly easy to, to get a hold of and to, to run. They're not so heavy that you get into road restrictions because you'll destroy roads if they're too heavy and that sort of thing. And this is something that the M5 Stuart is a very common vehicle to see at reenactments and fairs and parades and such. Another mid-war tank, the last mid-war tank we'll talk about is the M10 Wolverine. And the M10 Wolverine was one of the solutions to the increasingly heavily armored, more powerful tanks the Germans were fielding. It was technically a tank destroyer, but uh, it really meets most of the definitions of a tank and is often considered a tank in a lot of ways. But this vehicle, one thing that set it apart from the, the Sherman and even a lot, a lot of tanks from the time period, was it was specifically designed to deal with enemy armor, enemy tanks. So it was armed with a much more powerful 76 millimeter anti-tank gun, a much more high velocity gun that could penetrate a whole lot more armor and do a lot of damage. And at this point in the war, in the mid-war period, it could deal with virtually any German armor except maybe the heaviest, as long as it, as it was in medium to close range. It was an effective vehicle. A lot of, ger a lot of American tank doctrine had to do with uh, you'd have your Shermans and you'd send them out platoons and everything, and if they engaged heavy armor they needed help with, then they would basically call in for backup. They'd either get an airstrike or they'd send in a platoon or, or maybe two of tank destroyers like the M10 Wolverine. It was an effective vehicle for what it is. All the, all, basically all the Allied countries used it, and it served well. Now we're going to get into the late war tanks, and this is where we saw the most powerful, heaviest, biggest guns, most armor tanks, both the Axis and the Allies deployed, was during this late war period, 1944-1945. 
Germany tended to build just bigger and more powerful vehicles. And again, many logistical problems. You couldn't keep them in the field. You, they were hard to produce in numbers. Uh, they, they would break down a lot. They were hard to repair when they did break down. They, they couldn't even keep gas in them half the time. And while they were very effective if they got into combat and could stay into combat, uh, if they didn't get knocked out by a, a superior Amer allied air power or a naval bombardment or just more American or allied tanks, <clears throat> they just couldn't keep up with the flow of, of, of allied forces on both fronts, on the eastern and western fronts. Again, they had, had a lot of kills, uh, tank knockouts and that sort of thing. And in a lot of ways, if they were in battle, they could be very effective. But the Allies tended to focus on reliability and numbers so they could get a tank to where they needed to go. They could get a lot of tanks where they needed them to go, and they could keep them in the field. And, well, really, one worked and the other didn't. And that's kind of where we are at the late war. There were a lot more experimental tanks. There was a lot of fear because nobody knew exactly what the Germans had. There were a lot of fabled vehicles and weapons and defensive lines and stuff that didn't really turn into things. So there's some crazy experimental stuff, especially from this time, which would probably be a cool video in and of itself. But really what we'll see is a continuation of the, the kind of the doctrine and ideas from the other two periods. So the first one is the M18 Hellcat. Now, the M18 was another tank destroyer like the M10 we talked about a moment ago. It was armed with that same 76mm gun, but it had less armor and it was very fast. In fact, it was one of the fastest tanks or tracked AFVs, if you want to use that term, of World War II. And it filled a similar role to the M10. Again, a tank destroyer. It'd be called in when support was needed. And it was very effective. It was occasionally used for infantry support, but that's not what it was really designed for. But... It was mainly a tank destroyer and it filled that role very, very well. As I mentioned earlier, the M4 was constantly, the M4 Sherman was constantly getting upgraded and it had a lot of different variants. And a few of those variants mounted the 76 millimeter AT gun or anti-tank gun that was on the M10s and the M18s. And that's basically what it was. It was maybe a different turret, but it was basically an upgunned or it had a better gun Sherman. They were effective for what they were. Um, again, Encountering heavy German armor was increasingly rare. Actually, I guess I haven't mentioned that yet, especially in the late months of the war. On the Western Front, well, you did run into tanks, certainly. It wasn't nearly as common as Hollywood would kind of lead you to believe. But it could deal with tanks a lot better than, than its 75mm gunned cousins could. So that was, a very, that was a pretty common modification. Again, there were other modifications. We'll talk about one more in a moment. But that's what it is. It's an upgun Sherman, and it was effective. <clears throat> the last tank destroyer I want to talk about is the M36 Jackson. Now, this was, as I mentioned, a tank destroyer, but it now mounted a significantly more powerful and effective 90mm anti-tank gun that had been developed uh, by the United States. And this vehicle could fairly easily deal with everything but the absolute heaviest of German vehicles. And just to be clear, some of the heaviest German vehicles could not be uh, penetrated or destroyed from the front by any allied gun of the war really any one you could pound on a vehicle at least so just because the 90 millimeter couldn't pin it penetrate it that wasn't necessarily uncommon there were no guns that could really maybe naval guns or some heavy artillery that sort of thing but that was the case uh, for the m36 it was a very effective tank destroyer again it could deal with basically anything at virtually any practical range very effective and and pretty popular the next tank is another variant of the Sherman. This one's called the M4 Jumbo. Now this was less common. There were still a few hundred of these made, but this wasn't really a factory produced vehicle. This was a field modified vehicle that was basically just a heavily, heavily up armored Sherman. So one of the complaints about the Sherman was it didn't have all that much armor and virtually any decently sized, decently powerful German gun could penetrate it. And that was true. But what the Jumbo did was kind of fix that problem. That's not to say it couldn't have been penetrated by anything, but it could. It was impervious to a lot of, of, of fire that it would come up against. And it was designed as an assault tank, kind of what you think of tanks doing in Hollywood, right? Just kind of charging through and, and sort of in the middle of the fight. And the Jumbo was designed much more for that kind of role. Now, these tanks tended to be knocked out a lot mainly because they were used often to draw fire at the front of a column because they had so much more armor. And 
they were well armored enough and everything that oftentimes, to my understanding, these tanks, even if they were knocked out, they weren't damaged so heavily that they couldn't be recovered, repaired, and sent back out in the field. Very interesting looking tank. They had a version that mounted the 76 millimeter gun as well, but most of them had the 75 millimeter, and it, it was quite an effective tank. It was actually the only really deployed heavy tank that the Americans had during the war. And it was basically a, a like I said, it was a field modification of a medium tank. Very effective, though. And uh, I think a pretty cool looking tank as well. Another tank is another light tank, the M24 Chaffee. And this was a state of the art light tank. It, it basically used a lot of new technologies and it was a very effective light tank. It mounted the 75 millimeter gun, basically the same gun that was on the Sherman, but now it was on a light tank platform. And it served quite well in the late war period. I think, again, this is also very cool. Most of these tanks are cool looking, uh, but it was used as, to implement a lot of new technologies and it was a very effective light tank. It was used, I believe, by many countries after the war, although I don't know that America kept it that long. It was used by a lot of countries after the war because, well, it was effective for what it was. And a uh, very cool tank and another effective light tank that was much more practical in a lot of ways than some of the reconnaissance, the M5 Stuart and so on that we've already talked about. And finally, I want to talk about the M26 Pershing. Now, the M26 Pershing was the first of kind of the next generation of American tanks. It really started to, to implement a lot of technology and developments and learning from World War II. It was equipped with a powerful 90 millimeter anti-tank gun, the same gun that was on the M36 Jackson. But it was introduced too late in the war to really see much action. It did see a little bit of combat in the last weeks of the war. It, it did see a little bit of combat against enemy tanks as well, but very, very limited. In fact, exactly how much and what it faced is pretty unclear. It had its disadvantages, but it was a significant improvement on, on virtually every tank and, uh, in the war, especially American tanks, but even really German tanks in a lot of ways did have its disadvantages. It was it wasn't the first of a new generation, so there were quirks and things to work out. It was very underpowered. The engine wasn't powerful enough for it, and uh, but it would go on to serve well in the Korean War, and its main disadvantage, that, that very underpowered engine, would be solved with the M46, which was almost identical to the M26, but it had a, a new engine in it that was far more effective, and that was a very effective tank that would see action in the Korean War. Anyway, that's kind of the last main tank of, of America in World War II. I hope this has been an, a fun episode for you. I hope it's been interesting. I know I enjoyed it and a little bit different, but I hope that uh, maybe a little bit, a bit of a good break for us. And I hope that you found it useful. If you'd like to share the Kentuckian and, and support what we're doing, anything that you can do, help sharing, liking videos, commenting, subscribing to the YouTube channel or the Rumble channel, all that makes a big difference. Don't forget our store where you can buy Kentuckian and, and other similar merchandise. If that's something that would interest you, that way you can get some, some cool stuff out of the deal, but also support the Kentuckian. And just remember that I really appreciate your all support and that if you'd like to support the Kentucky in a more personal way, I have a Patreon that's linked in the description as well as everything else that we've talked about. The store, by the way, I do want to make mention of that, is linked on the Facebook page. So just go to the Facebook page and in the description, you'll find the link to the, the merchandise store. But if there's anything you can do to help other than just uh, watching and, and listening to these videos, it's greatly appreciated. I appreciate your all support, and I'm glad that you've chosen to spend a few minutes with a Kentuckian. And remember, folks, as long as you and I are doing what's right, we make a real difference in this whole world. This has been Ryan Dalton of the Kentuckian, signing off.